my special half. <laughs> this is awesome. Uh, it is so wonderful to be here. We want to thank uh, Tara for allowing us this opportunity to speak and all of the KGM team. And I think about Tara some years ago, I was just sitting watching television. And I was flipping through the channels. And so I saw this lady who was speaking about the biblical view of women in marriage. And I was just blown away by the things that I was hearing, so much so that I recorded it. And I went back and watched it again. And I had my wife watch it with me. And well, little did I know <laughs> that six years later, we would be here together speaking at one of her events. And, you know, we serve a mighty God. I mean, God is orchestrating things in our lives, even when we don't realize it. And, and we can rest in the peace and the comfort of what he's doing in our lives. And so not only is he orchestrating things in our lives as individuals, but for all of humanity, God is orchestrating things toward this event that we look at and we call the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're going to talk to you today about the rapture of the church, the great event in which our Lord is going to call us to be with him. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time together. We thank you, Lord, for your great sacrifice, making a way so that we can have eternal life. We ask, Lord, that this time of fellowship would be for your honor and for your glory and all things that are spoken, that it be nothing but sound doctrine. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to read to you 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, and it reads, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Isn't that comforting in itself? Yes. To always be with the Lord should be our main goal as Christians, right? And in 1 Peter 1, 8 through 9, it actually says, the goal of our faith is the salvation of our souls. And so that should make us excited. That should be our main goal, not what God is doing for us and how he can bless us here and everything. That's a plus, but we should be excited about eternal life, that inheritance that is imperishable, incorruptible, unfading with Jesus. That should be our goal and our focus. And the Bible also tells us that we are made for eternity. He set eternity in our hearts. And so we should seek things that are eternal. And in Matthew 25, 6 and 10, it says, And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. The bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. And this is in Matthew 25. So this verse is all about our eternity, those who are in Christ Jesus. And it's about this glorious event of the rapture of the church. So we are currently awaiting what Jesus prophesied. He prophesied that he would return at the end of days. And he came at the first coming to save. He's coming to judge at his second coming at the end of the tribulation. And if you've never heard of the tribulation, the tribulation is a time of, of great outpouring of God's wrath. But praise be to God that Jesus is coming to rescue his bride, the church, to give us a way of escape from that wrath. So it has been nearly 2,000 years since the last prophecies were reported in the book of Revelation. Now, it's unfortunate that in the church today, there's division that continues to grow concerning the return of Christ. It's a very hot button topic. And when I think about the church, the first century churches, they were being persecuted by the Roman emperors, but they still stayed tightly bonded with one another. And I think the world would look at them and say, my, how they love one another. But I fear today that the church looks at us and how we fight over these issues and think my, how they fight with one another. There was a survey that was done that found that amongst Christians, 36% believe the rapture will happen before the tribulation, 4% in the middle, 18% at the end, 13% stated other, 
4% were not sure, and sadly, 25% no longer believe in a literal rapture of the church. So we can see there's not a consensus even among Christians, and so we see a lot of infighting that is taking place. And as you can see, too, the secular world could care less whether there's a rapture or not. They're busy with other things. But the number of people who are looking for Christ's return is decreasing each year, so that's sad. And then there are the debates about the timing. That's where a lot of our debates come from. And that actually ends up driving wedges between believers. But then it also drives unbelievers away. So we're, we're outside of our purpose. We're supposed to be drawing people to Christ, right? Mm -hmm. But why can't believers get on the same page about the rapture? Why can't they agree? I believe that it's because they're focused on the wrong thing. We should be focused on why mm -hmm. Jesus is coming back, not when. When is not really relevant too much, but when is the most important thing. So we're focused on the wrong thing. So we're, what we want to share with you today is what's known as the Galilean wedding tradition. Now, are these prophetic clues that point to our Lord's coming or ancient superstitions? Jesus and all of the apostles were Galilean. He spoke with them in the vernacular of the Galilean culture, things that they will understand. So even though throughout the land of Israel, the cultures share different practices, but the Galileans had practices that were unique to them. And so why is this important? Well, Jesus used cultural norms. He spoke often in parables so that people would understand the things that he was trying to convey. For example, the people there, the, the, the profession of fisher, fishermen was very dominant. So he would say, you will be fishers of men. It's so like today, we would say the White House made a statement about blah, blah, blah. Well, we know exactly what that means, but someone in a foreign country, maybe 100 years from now, have no clue of what that's talking about. So his parables were crystal clear to those he was speaking to. So when Jesus spoke to the apostles about the end of the age, he spoke in ways that they would understand through their culture. We must remember that two thirds of the gospel took place in the land of Galilee. And what we find throughout scripture is how important marriage is. Marriage is very important to God. And the ancient Galilean wedding ceremony aligns beautifully with prophecies of the Bible. And in the Galilean wedding back in the ancient times, that wedding was the most important event of the time. And back then, the most important events took place at the main gate. You know how they would always have the walls, the cities would have gates. At the main gate. And so whenever there was a betrothal, which is an engagement between two people, man and a woman, they, they would always rush to the main gate to witness that betrothal. And when you think about betrothal, that means two people who are set apart for each other. And that could not be dissolved without a religious divorce. And so a proposal was given, and this was a covenant. So it was presented to the bride, and she would agree to the terms, and in that Galilean betrothal process, there was going to be a bridal price, a price for the bride, not to purchase her, but it was like a dowry. And what they would do is this, this would be like um, money that the parents would use in case anything ever happened to that bridegroom. So he was already taking care of her. But um, this would be presented to the bride's parents as a gift. And then other gifts would be exchanged with the most extravagant going to the bride, of course. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at that, it was very thought provoking to me because I thought about how when we are set apart for Jesus Christ, don't we receive gifts? We receive the ultimate gift, the most extravagant gift of salvation and eternal life. We receive forgiveness. We receive the Holy Spirit. We receive faith and his grace and even spiritual gifts. Right. So I thought that that was really cool. And another thing to note that's very important is that the bridegroom's father was the one who read the conditions of that covenant on behalf of his son at that betrothal. And he was also the one who provided the payment for that for the bride. And the bridegroom after that would be handed a pitcher of wine and he would pour the wine into a cup and offer it to his bride to be. And this was called a cup of joy. So it was almost like, you know, the guy today getting on one knee and giving an engagement ring. And so he would present this to the bride and she has a choice to either accept it or reject it. She had the final authority. It was all up to her. 
and she would drink of it to display her, her acceptance of that proposal. And then the bridegroom would take that cup and drink of it himself to solidify their covenant. I think that's so beautiful. <laughs> Um, but he would also promise to not drink of it again until he did so with her in his father's house. Now, this may sound familiar because this is identical to what Jesus did with the apostles in the upper room before he went to the cross. In Matthew 26, 27 through, through 29, it reads, then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. But this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. So Jesus offered this cup to the apostles in the upper room, and this was the new covenant. Now, many, sadly, in our world today, they reject the offer of Jesus Christ to take the cup. But Jesus also said, as we saw in the text, he said, I promise you, I will not drink of this cup again until I do so with you in the Father's kingdom or in the Father's house. So when we do what we call communion, the breaking of bread and the drinking of wine, this is symbolic. Again, we call it communion because it means no longer two, but one. It's a common union. So this illustration would be very clear to the Galileans of that day. And this is likely why they asked the question of when not why these things would take place. Remember the first miracle of Jesus took place at a wedding where there was this Galilean wedding tradition. So if we go back to the tradition, after drinking together, the bridegroom would leave his bride, his engaged betrothed, and they would live apart until their wedding day. So he would go away to the father's house to prepare what is known as a kupa, which is a small house or room that would be an addition to his father's house. That is where they would live in. So he would go away to prepare this. Jesus told his disciples he would leave them at his first coming to do what? To go and prepare a place. John 14, two through, two through four says, in my father's house are many mansions. The NIV says rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Where I go, you know, and the way you know. This is Galilean wedding language. He promised to come back to take them to where he was going. He was speaking as a Galilean bridegroom. So we must understand the culture of that day to be able to understand what Jesus was conveying. And, and during this period, when he would go away, the bride was to prepare herself. And <laughs> This is all, this, all the different things that she would be doing um, as he's gone away. And she did this until he would return. She would have to go and acquire fabric for a dress, right? Um, but she didn't have David's bridal or bridal boutique like we have today. <laughs> they lived in small towns and they had traveling merchants. And so she had to look out for those merchants to make sure that she can find the right fabric for her dress, which needed to be white for purity. And so it could be hit or miss in finding what she needed for her, her dress. And so if she missed a merchant, could not get the material, then she could not have the proper wedding garments. And without the proper wedding garments, she was not ready for her wedding. And so she had to be vigilant and find the right things for her wedding. And she was always to be pure. And she did not sit and eat the bread of idleness. She had to occupy until he came back. And so she was serious, she was alert, she was watchful, she was self-controlled, not distracted by things. And I would think even then she was probably being transformed in a way. She probably had to prepare spiritually, um, mentally, waiting, you know, and then also physically probably. This is her new man. She's, you know, she's about to get married. Then just like we do, we go on, you know, Weight Watchers, Noom or whatever to get ready because we want to look good for our man on our wedding day. So these are things that she may have been doing. But what's important to know is neither the bride nor the bridegroom would know when the wedding day was going to take place. This was a surprise wedding. And what's important about this is, although the cultures were similar in those times, the Galilean wedding was the only one that was done in a surprise as a surprise. So no one in the entire town knew when the, when the wedding was going to happen. No one knew except for the bridegroom's father. And everyone invited to the wedding, including the bridal party, had to be alert. 
And so when I looked at this, it made me think of Matthew 25, verse 13, where it says, therefore be alert because you don't know either the day or the hour. And so it would take approximately a year for, to prepare for this wedding, but still no one knew the day or the hour. They just had an approximation. And in, in the Bible, Jesus gives different accounts of no one knows the day or the hour. And one of those is Mark 13, 32 through 33, where it reads, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. So Jesus himself, the son, does not even know. So the bridegroom back to the Galilean wedding, when he went away, he had to prepare to feed approximately 50 to 100 people at this feast. Now, he was eager for this moment. He was excited as he was preparing. And Jesus today is eagerly preparing for us as his bride. Jesus said that he would come as a thief in the nights for those that were not ready. And when you look at the Galilean wedding, it would come in the middle of the night, often at midnight. The bride and the bridesmaids were to always be ready. They will always be prepared for that moment that could come at any time. So after the bridegroom's father approved this kupa, the preparations, at some point he would turn to his son, again, who was eagerly awaiting this moment, and he would say, go get your bride. Remember, only the father knew when this approval would come. The bride had to always be ready. Now, I told my wife here that when we were engaged, I said, if we had lived back in the Galilean wedding tradition, back in the Bible days, there are certain things we would have had to follow. Now, she likes to sleep in this thing called a bouffant. Bonnet. A bonnet. Okay. <laughs> some some do, do rag or something. <laughs> and it's not the most attractive thing in the world. Um, I'll be honest, it's not attractive at all, but... I, I get it. You wear it to protect your hair. And so I understand. But I told her if we were living in the Galilean days, if I had showed up for the wedding and she came to the door with that headdress on, I would have said she's not ready. I'm going back to the father's house. And so it was important. The bride had to be ready at all times. It was so important. And it's like we need to be ready for our Lord. So the son, when he got the command from his father, he would grab a shofar, the Bible says a, a trumpet, and he would head out to get his bride. So as he and his party would go through the streets, they would blow this trumpet to sound the announcement, and they would shout that the bridegroom is coming. And since that night, it would wake up the entire town. And then when the, when the bride would hear this announcement and the trumpet, she would rise up and trim her lamp. And this announcement, the bridegroom was the bridegroom is coming, was what she had been waiting for all that time. Remember in Matthew 25, verse 6, it says, And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. And so as the trumpets would blast, or the trumpet would blast, they would walk the streets and people would join in. Only those who were ready would be able to join in, curlers and all, <laughs> bonnets and all. But uh, after about that year of waiting, the bridegroom and the bride were united. And that, that's what they were looking for. And at that time, the groomsmen would lower a litter, L-I-T-T-E-R. It's like a seat with no wheels. And, you know, the bride can step on it and sit down. And in Hebrew, it's called a perion, A-P-P-I-R-Y-O-N. And so the bride would step on it, sit down, and then they would actually lift her up into the air and she would be carried away to the bridegroom's father's house. And this was actually called flying the bride to the father's house, or it was called flying the bride home because that's where they would stay. And so we can see the parallels between this and the rapture. And so there are clues in scripture that speak to this. And so the bridegroom would take his bride to the father's house where they and their wedding party would be sealed in, their room, in the room for seven days to partake in the wedding feast. So once at this wedding celebration, the door was shut and no one could enter or leave for seven days. And so this wedding feast was for all of the people who had accepted the wedding invitation and had joined in. And so as you can see, this is like a picture 
of what will happen at the rapture and the wedding feast of the lamb or the wedding supper of the lamb, as the Bible calls it. In Revelation 19, verse 9, it talks about the marriage supper, which is the wedding supper. And it reads, the then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. So as you can see, the house of a Galilean wedding at that father's house, it's a per perfect picture of heaven. Jesus Christ is the bridegroom and the church is his bride. He purchased the bride by paying the price for our sins, by dying at Calvary, shedding his blood. He is now at the Father's house and he's preparing a place for us. And at some point, God the Father is going to turn to God the Son and he's going to say, go, get your bride. Remember, Jesus is eagerly awaiting for this moment. And at that point, the trumpet will sound there will be a shout from the archangel and the rapture of the church will take place and mark Christ's return for his church. We will go to heaven, to the Father's house for seven years where we will be sealed. We will partake in the marriage supper. This is the time in which Jesus will fulfill his promise that he made to the apostles 2000 years ago when he said, I will not drink of this cup again until I do so with you in the Father's house. So we are going to spend that seven years with our Lord in celebration, and then we're going to exit victoriously as he comes to claim his earthly kingdom at the end of the seven-year tribulation. Now, I'm sure Jesus was eager at the Last Supper to eat with us again in the Father's house. He's going to save his bride from the wrath of the last days, because those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, we are not appointed to the wrath that God will pour out upon the unbelieving world. And in 1 John 2, verse 2, it says, he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. And propitiation means the removal of divine wrath. So his death is the means that turns God's wrath from, from us today. Praise God. Jesus warned that many will not accept his offer to attend the wedding feast. Just like in the Galilean wedding, the door would get shut. No one could go in. No one could go out for seven days. Those who reject Jesus' offer today are going to be left here to suffer for seven years of tribulation. Isaiah 26 says he will pour out his indignation upon unbelievers. But of the church, he said, and shut your doors behind you, hide yourself as it were for a little moment until the indignation is past. And so the Galileans are key to understanding why and what the rapture is. We need to focus on why, that's the, the best part, right? And so it's never been more important now than to speak, you know, to speak up about the fact that Jesus is returning. He's coming back because more people are seeing the rapture as less and less relevant. The numbers are going down each year. So pastors have to tell their congregations, even um, as the parishioners, we have to say, I wanna hear about this. Can we have something about, about the rapture? So we can help with that as well. And we've been talking about marriage, the wedding. Well, we know that Satan hates marriage and it's because of what it represents. It's the microcosm of heaven and that's big. And so when we think about marriage, we think about how marriage is about Christ and the church. It's about Jesus's love for the church. And in Ephesians 5, verses 31 through 32, it reads, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. And so marriage is, is a covenant, and it brings two people together as one, and that oneness is permanent. And so shall believers be one with their Lord Jesus Christ in heaven, eternally, permanently. And this whole thing about no one knows the day or the hour, as stated in Mark 13, has caused problems in the church. Why? Well, a lot of people think that Bible prophecy is a fringe topic. They, um, and since we don't know the day or the hour, we're not to set dates. And, but there have been some who have set dates, unfortunately, and it has put a stain on anything prophetic in the Bible. And so it causes the prophecy from the Bible and Bible prophecy to be called marginalized, 
fringe and most pastors don't want to touch it because the quacks and the kooky people are talking about the rapture again and all of this stuff. And so they claim that it won't grow the church. And so they steer clear of it. But is the ultimate goal of a believer to be with, the, with Jesus Christ eternally, right? So this is something that needs to be talked about, but churches are staying clear of it. And, and it's partly to be accepted by the world because a lot of people don't want to deal with it. They don't want to focus on that. In a study that was done, 450 sermons were sampled from pastors throughout the country. And it was found that only 2% were from a prophetic passage. Now, the Bible is one-third Bible prophecy, so there's a major gap there. The king is coming. The bridegroom is coming. That should be a message of rejoicing, a message that should be in the forefront of our minds. So if you remove the return of Jesus Christ from the gospel, you are gutting a huge part of the gospel. And the Bible tells us that apostasy would come in the last days, a great falling away. It says that many would be asleep. You see, there are some that believe but are not truly born again. Does even Satan believes in Jesus? Yes. That's why Jesus gave the parable of the 10 virgins. He said there would be five who were wise, meaning they were filled. They had their, their uh, lamps filled with oil to make the trip to the father's house. That is a symbolism of the Holy Spirit. But there were five who were unwise. They did not have enough oil to make the trip at night. Their oil, their lamps would burn out. These are the ones who maybe they go to church, but they are not truly born again. They know enough about Christ they know enough about the fact that he's coming back again, but they've never truly received him. And so that is why we need to push this message of, of Christ is coming again. You truly need to be born again. And also in a survey, it was found that 85% of Americans do not believe in the core beliefs of the Bible. I mean, that's, that's very alarming. And that's why humanism is exploding. And we see things today in which people are looking more towards the feelings and ideas of, of man and our emotions rather than the true word of God. And so that leaves many Christians not being excited about the wedding day. They're not excited about Jesus coming back. You know, as little girls, we dreamed of our wedding day. You had the little books, you draw your wedding dress, you would pretend your Barbies and Ken were getting married, all of these things. And even shopping for wedding dresses when we didn't have a groom, uh, you know, a groom. <laughs> Some people did that. I don't know. But you were excited. This is something you look forward to, you know. And so today, though, more people are more interested in the cares of this world. And Satan is taking hold of that. He's got a strong grip on it. And he wants to distract believers and unbelievers. So don't think just because you're a believer and you follow Christ that he's not after you because he is. He wants believers to take their eyes off Jesus to disregard God's work and your preparations. And he wants you to not care about turning people to righteousness. He wants to distract you. And then for unbelievers, he wants them to be totally deceived by the things that are going on in this world, the ungodliness, the division. You know, Satan is pretty much grooming mockers and scoffers. We've seen it happening in, in, on TV today. They're mocking and scoffing at people who believe in Jesus. And the Bible predicts that there would be scoffers and mockers in the end times, right? In Jude 18 and 19, it says, they told you in the end time, there will be scoffers walking according to their own ungodly desires. And these people create divisions and are unbelievers, not having the spirit. As we talk about signs of the times, it's important to know that the rapture of the church is a signless event, meaning nothing has to take place before the rapture. The rapture technically could have happened in the first century. But these signs that we talk about are things that are pointing to the second coming of Christ, meaning when he actually touches ground. You see, at the rapture, we are caught up to meet him in the air and we go to heaven. But when he comes back at the second coming, he's coming all the way to place his feet on the earth. And so it's like when we are out here on I-40, say we're driving to Winston-Salem. And if all the signs for Greensboro have been removed. As you're driving along, if you see Winston-Salem, 90 miles, Winston-Salem, 60 miles, you know that Greensboro is that much nearer because you have to get to Greensboro before Winston-Salem. So when we look at the rapture, we know that that time is near because we see the signs already. Jesus warned about deception. As we look today, Facebook says there are 72 genders. Wow. <laughs> he said there will be wars and rumors of wars. Well, we know World War I, II, Afghanistan, that's been going on for quite some time. He said that would be nation against nation. In the Greek, that's translated ethnos against ethnos, which is where we get our word ethnicity. 
Just look at what's been happening in our nation the last several years with uh, Black Lives Matter. Everything today is racist. No matter what you say is racism, critical race theory, even infiltrating the church. He said there will be pestilences, COVID-19. We don't need to say more on that. <laughs> Lawlessness, causing love to grow cold. Again, look at BLM rioting in the streets. He said there will be a hatred of truth. Again, think about the rush to judgment. Whenever there's an incident between a white police officer and a black uh, citizen, people automatically say it's racist, racism. They don't bother to look at the facts. He said there will be one world government in a cashless society. How many times have you seen over the last year and a half due to national coin shortage, pay with card or exact change? He said it would be as it was in the days of Noah where they had a hybrid race of people. Look today at transhumanism. And then the super sign, Israel. He said, when you see Israel blossom into a fig tree again, you will know that my time is near. Israel became a nation again in 1948. So we are that generation that will see our Lord's return. As I think about my earthly wedding day with this beautiful woman beside me, we were married in a church that had these tall stained glass windows in the foyer. And when the sanctuary doors were closed, you could not see it. And so as I was standing there at the front of the church waiting for my bride, eagerly waiting, I remember that moment <laughs> when those doors were open and the sun came through those stained glass windows and I saw her there in all her beauty, that radiance, and I was overcome with emotion. It was such a beautiful scene. And so I think about how Jesus is going to see us on that day. Our, his bride, when he, we are called up to meet him, he's going to see us in all of our beauty and all the radiance because of his shed blood. So for those out there today, if you've never received him, will you accept the cup that Jesus Christ is offering? Because the time is near. Will you accept his invitation? Because the bridegroom is coming soon. So can we give our Lord a hand clap of praise for his soon coming? for you. They have offered to stay for question and answer session. So um, you guys, they're going to ask questions and then you can, um, I'll, I'll repeat it for the Zoom friends over there. So really quickly, do you mind closing us in prayer for our Zoom people and then we'll start the question and answer session? <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, once again for this time together. We ask, Lord, that for all who are on the Zoom, all who are present here today, Lord, that they would see you in this message, Lord, and that they would be excited about your return that is coming. And again, Lord, for any who have not received you, that they will receive that offer, the offer that you give, Lord, the cup, and that they will receive it and know that through it, Lord, that they can have eternal life. And we just thank you, Lord Jesus, for all the things that you are doing. And we so anxiously, Lord, await your return we, be, we will be reunited with you, Lord, and see you in all your glory for all of eternity. These things we pray in your great name. Amen. Amen. And you guys, um, those of you on Zoom, if you cannot stay for the question and answer session, they are going to do, you want to stay logged in, right? Okay. They are going to do a workshop. Um, and it is October 26th at 7 p.m. It's going to be virtual. And they will handle all questions and answers there as well. So, but right now, you ready for questions? Sure. Yes. Okay. Anybody has a question? Um, can they dive into the revelation stuff? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Send all the hard ones to Danita. <laughs> Michelle. Yeah, so um, so the question was with now how how much there is so much division concerning the, the doctrine of the rapture when the topic comes up, many, many want to, um, I guess, sort of shy away from will win. Well, if we look at the, this passage in which Jesus said, no one knows the day or the hour, 
Now, it's, it's sort of hard for us to fathom because Jesus is God. He's God the Son. He's God in the flesh. But based on the scriptures, Jesus himself doesn't even know. He doesn't know when the Father is going to say, go get your bride. So if Jesus Christ, as the creator of all things, does not know, then why should we, as fallen man, think that we should know? The thing is to always be ready, to always be prepared. And, and our Lord said to occupy until he comes. We don't sit on our hands. We don't just think, well, it, it, the rapture is going to take place at any moment, so I can just sit back and relax. No, we are to occupy, to try to bring others. And the key thing is to be excited because it is a time in which it's going to be a great event to look forward to and to be excited about. So not so much focus on the, the when, but again, the why, and just be excited and ready for it when that time comes. I think that's part of occupying. Um, when you're <laughs> eternal minded and you're thinking about um, when I do get to be with Jesus, your heart is full of that instead of, oh, such and such, you see this headline, that headline, that headline, and you're stressing, oh, it's going to happen. And, you know, those types of things. But when you are prepared, just like if we're preparing for an event to speak or something, when you're prepared, you feel so much peace. You feel ready and you're more excited, that anxious excitement about sharing God's word, right? Then you are about, oh, the logistics. Oh, what about this? And oh, did I do this or that? You're excited about, I have the opportunity to go and do thus and so, right? And so you occupy, we're more occupied then, our minds are occupied on, we get to speak to you all and share God's word and be excited about it, right? And I think that's part of being, when you occupy, you're not getting distracted with those other things. And that's why we were saying it's so important to focus on the why rather than when, because you don't know when, so don't worry about it. Just be ready, you know, so. Okay, let's say, for instance, um, what I would say are nominal Christians. They go to church, they check the box. Are they saved? We may not know for sure. That's between them and, and Jesus. But you don't go through the motions of um, you have the label, I'm a Christian, stuck to your chest, and then that's it. Um, when you're preparing, as, as believers, we're constantly going through a period of sanctification. It's, it's a constant thing until we all get our glorified bodies and get to heaven. There's always work to be done in our hearts because it's flesh. So we should always be ex examining ourselves, making sure that we're on point with the Lord, that we're focused on him. And as we're doing that, we're being equipped to be able to bring along others to turn others to righteousness. And that's what we should be doing, is turning other people to righteousness. We are God's workers, his vessels for building his kingdom. So that's being prepared. Like the bride had bridesmaids. She wasn't just preparing herself and saying, huh, I'm ready. Girlfriend, what, are you ready? Do you have your dress yet? You know, she, I'm sure they all work together. It's about discipleship and community, surrounding yourself with other like-minded believers, being prepared, not getting distracted with the cares of this world, being vigilant, keep seeking God's word. Every time we read it, you learn something new. Just because we've done our 365 day, check the box, I read it this day, does not mean that we just stop. We're constantly growing in the Lord. We're saved, but sanctification is until we get to heaven in our glorified bodies. And I would just add to that, uh, really study and meditate on the parable of the 10 virgins. You know, we touched on it just a little, but that was a, a very beautiful picture of what Jesus said, how things will look in the last days, because there are those who had their lamps full of oil. And not only were their lamps full, they had extra vessels of oil. And that again represents the Holy Spirit. It's so important for us as preparing to constantly ask for a filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we become saved, we receive the Holy Spirit. But as we go through life, sometimes that relationship, just like in a, a marriage between a man and a woman, you can sort of start to sort of take things for granted, right? And sort of drift apart a little bit if you're not careful. We leak. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you need to be filled. So ask the Holy Spirit to continue to refresh you, to fill you. And again, for those who um, are not true believers, they, they know enough about him. They go to church. And they thought, just like the, the parable of the five uh, foolish virgins, they thought that because they were in the wedding party, that they would get to go. But what they found out is, no, they didn't have enough. 
they didn't truly have the Holy Spirit. So that is why it's so important to become saved, to truly get the Holy Spirit and be filled with him, to be prepared for when that time comes. Nene. So the last um, the prophets, Jesus. 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 J
Well, so thank you so much for all that you shared. And in all the years that I've studied the word, I hadn't quite known even all those details about the Galilean wedding and the surprise and the bride and the little bit of like midnight. <laughs> um, some of that is a little anxiety provoking. Like I'm someone that kind of likes to plan, and, <laughs> um, which obviously the beautiful walk that we have with Jesus. It, trust is such a big part mm -hmm. i think part of it like you know when my husband will surprise me and say all right i'm surprising i'm taking you away on a weekend i don't know where we're going is it the mountains or the beach <laughs> you know mm -hmm. it can be a little anxiety provoking like well babe i want to be ready i want to look good when i'm there i want to you know swim <laughs> through the boots um, so it's, it's interesting hearing this because it does cause me to think there can be a little bit of feeling uncomfortable because we want answers we want like, what exactly is it? Like, I don't want, if I were to be in bed at night with the hat, yeah, your body, <laughs> yeah. surprise, okay, you're ready to walk down the aisle. You know, there's a <laughs> bit of that. Uh, and so some of what I'm just challenged in as you share is that part of me that needs to trust the Lord because it's a little uncomfortable not knowing. You know, some yeah. of the unknown which so much of anxiety, you know, is tied into embrace and certainty, you know. Yeah. Um, so maybe you guys can just speak to that a little bit, that element, like I wonder, why God, why did you say the bridegroom's thought, like if my future father-in-law knocked on the door at midnight, you know, like all those things, I wonder why, how that was part of God's plan, it's just our human nature, that we will be lazy, being needing to be diligent, you don't know when it could be, you could not be ready, because human nature, we have a tendency to be lazy, or let things go, slip in our discipline. I think part of it is um, God wants those who diligently seek him. He wants those who are serious about him and his business. He wants those who love him and adore him and want to abide in him. Our, the, those who are constantly focused on him. And I think, too, it, it just helps him to see who really belong to him, who really is, who, who really wants to be part of his kingdom. And I think, too, you know, he is called I am that I am. He does as he will. You know, he wants, he has a certain way of doing things. I mean, I think that it's part of him being sovereign, him being God and him, he knows all. And if, if his, like Brian had said earlier, if his son does not even know when he's going to say, go get your bride, then who are we to know before Jesus? Who are we to know the intimate details of that? I think that's, like you said, as part of us trusting him, because our trust in him shows faith and he wants to find as many faithful as possible. And I think as you say, I'm going to trust him, it puts you at peace as you, you know, occupy until he comes. And, but I think ultimately he gets to find out who he, who his people are, how much we love him and how much we're willing to wait. And it also gives us something to do to stay busy. We got to stay busy, stay busy, helping to lead people to Christ. So. And I will add to that, that um, I think human nature, we tend to procrastinate. So <laughs> if we were to know when, I think a lot of people would just sort of procrastinate and just say, okay, well, now it's getting to be about time. Let me get serious. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like in school, if you have a teacher that is going to give a pop quiz, uh, you're, you're going to be prepared. You want to make sure you're always ready. But if she sets a date a few weeks ago, wait, you, you just sort of do your own thing. And then you cram the night before. So I think that's that's part of it. Also, I, I do think it's human nature to sort of have somewhat of an anxiety of the unknown. I think that's normal and natural. But one thing I want to assure everyone of is that when we say be ready, make sure you're always ready. You may have a concern about, well, what if I'm at a moment of sin? Because even though we are born again, we still sin sometimes. We still fall in our human nature, our fallen nature. And, and we will continue to, to sin until we are in our glorified state. Well, so what happens if I have unrighteous anger towards my, my wife and, and Jesus returns at that point for the rapture? Well, that's not the stage you want to be in when, when you meet the, the Lord as the bridegroom, but you are assured salvation. We don't have to worry thinking that, well, if I am in a moment of, of weakness and sin, that means I will, I will miss. So that should not be a, a point of anxiety at all. But certainly the just the moment. I mean, I, I do think about seeing Jesus face to face, what that's going to be like. I mean, yeah, I, I feel some some anxiousness about that. Um, but, you know, it's going to be a good anxiousness.
Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but but I too go back to God believes what's in your heart, not the words that are coming out of your mouth at that moment. Yes. Yes. We have time for one last question. That's okay. okay. Yes, ma'am. No one knows, but I know I said, come, Jesus, come, mm -hmm. and somebody can say. Hmm. So how do you how do you balance that? Being being, being excited of the Lord, but also knowing that when we're gone, it is going to be gone. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's hard because the tribulation is coming. And that's why we we share the gospel of Jesus Christ so that we can get as many people on the ark as possible to come on and, and um, go to be with Jesus in the rapture. Um, but we are supposed to say, Lord, come quickly. Because that's, remember, that's our ultimate goal. First Peter says, that's the ultimate goal, our salvation and being able to be with Christ Jesus. Maybe um, you, it could be where you can point out the joy of the Lord, the joy of being in Christ. So you don't have to be like, no, 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 um, don't come. We just want to try to get as many people to know Christ Jesus for themselves, to taste and see that the Lord is good so that they can come and, and be able to go home to be with Jesus um, in the rapture instead of being here. It's going to be a terrible time. And I think that um, one of the uh, downsides with some churches, they don't want to touch that because they call it doom and gloom and scary. And uh, But some people may require some scaring to get them in shape, to get them, you know, hey, giddy up, as Tara would say. They need to giddy up and, and, and go ahead and, and get on the ball and accept Christ Jesus. But um, because God is love, but he's also, he has wrath, but that's discipline. And so, you know, just like a father disciplines, you know, those, he, you know, the child that he loves, that's part of who God is. And that, that's, he's sovereign, he's over all things, but the wrath is coming for those who have rejected his son. And that's real, that's the word of God. And that's what should be taught by the spiritual, you know, the church leaders, the pastors or whomever, you have to talk about, yes, heaven is going to be a wonderful place. Don't you wanna go? But you also have to say, if you're left here during the tribulation, he, there's gonna be an outpouring of his wrath. It should not be 2% of the prophetic scriptures in the Bible taught in the church. We have to know, and it's not to scare, but it's to get people to realize the great reward Jesus Christ is. He is our reward. We are not appointed to the wrath of God. And so share with them the good news, but don't be afraid to share with them. This is, you know, we should say, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord, because that's.